Welcome everybody to the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual. I'm your host, Robert Kraft on behalf of SNN Network. And I'm very pleased to bring to you our next panel here for our event. This panel is titled, Current Issues in the Accounting World. And it is being moderated by our good friend and sponsor, Neil Levine from Friedman LLP. And we'd like to thank all of our sponsors for this panel today, Friedman LLP, Markham LLP, and Weinberg and Company, all of all of our friends in the front. We love you guys. So with that, Neil, take it away. All right, Robert. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having us again. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Planet Microcap Showcase Conference and the Accounting Panel, Current Issues in the Accounting World. I'm honored once again to be the moderator of another Planet Microcap Showcase. Friedman LLP has been the lead sponsor for the last seven years and uh, at the virtual and in-person conferences. First off, I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleagues who I've been fortunate enough to discuss the current events that are happening as it relates to current issues in the accounting world, going public, and the pandemic um, that we're getting over. Each of the panelists in a few minutes can have a few minutes or so to tell them, uh, to tell us about themselves, their special areas of service, and their practices. So once again, I'm Neil Levine, uh, the co-leader of the SEC practice of Friedman LLP since uh, 2004. We're an accounting firm of over 600 employees formed 97 years ago. Our SEC practice has grown to number 13 with the amount of registrants that we service. We handle public companies on the national exchanges, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, and a few on the OTC markets group. We also audit private companies um, contemplating going public. We have a very large international presence as we are currently number four with auditing um, Chinese subsidiaries that are trading here in the US. With being the largest independent uh, firm in the DFK world body of audit firms, we have affiliates in 80 countries with um, 180 affiliates to handle the public's needs. Now I would like to introduce my panelists. Um, number one, I have John Hughes, CPA, a friend and audit partner of Markham LLP. Um, I have Corey Fisher, um, the managing partner of Weinberg and Company. And I have my partner, Brian Kearns, uh, audit partner for Friedman LLP in our SEC business. So with that, um, we're going to ask the panelists some questions. Um, each panelist after can jump in and um, have a lively discussion as we have done in other years. So John, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, Markham, and your practice? I appreciate that, Neil, uh, and great to great to see everyone in this year's uh, this year's this year's uh, conference. Um, so my name again is John Hughes. Uh, I'm an assurance partner at Markham LLP, uh, based in our firm's Los Angeles office. Uh, I've been with the firm almost uh, 14 years. Uh, Markham, of course, is uh, is one of the largest uh, public accounting firms in the United States. Uh, I spend most of my time uh, in our in our SEC practice group. Uh, about 90, 95% of my time deals with publicly traded companies across multiple industries, whether it's tech, biotech, uh, digital assets and blockchain, uh, and of course, uh, uh, special purpose uh, acquisition companies. Uh, Markham is one of the largest firms in the country. Our SEC practice, I believe now is number five. Um, and uh, again, looking forward to, uh, to a lively discussion on this panel this morning. Uh, thank you, John, and welcome. Um, next panelist, Corey Fisher, who I've had the pleasure of probably being on the last seven panels, but Corey, how are you doing out in LA? Doing good, Neil. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be back again at the conference. Uh, hopefully next year we'll be back in Las Vegas, but uh, for now, the virtual event, uh, two years in a row. Um, I 
My name is Corey Fisher. I'm the managing partner for Weinberg & Company. We're a, a CPA firm based here in Los Angeles. Uh, we focus primarily on uh, working with public companies, the emerging companies in particular, companies that are ready to go for an IPO, companies that are going to list for the first time. Uh, we've been doing it a long time. We have uh, anywhere from 50 to 60 registrants at any one time in our client base. Um, and uh, glad to be back at the conference again this year. Uh, thanks, Corey. And last but not least, I have my partner, Brian Kearns. I was lucky enough to steal Brian out of Deloitte, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, maybe eight years ago, who remembers? Brian, welcome to the conference. Thank you very much, Neil. And it's uh, it's only been about six years since I've uh, been able to work with you here, but I've uh, been been in the uh, world for about 20 years uh, working on uh, SEC clients. Uh, I'm a partner out of the Marlton office in South Jersey. Um, like I said, I've been here for about six years and I do, you know, any kind of uh, public clients that we bring in. We do a lot of tech clients. Uh, we do a lot of manufacturing clients. We do, uh, you know, a lot of gaming clients. Uh, that's one of the new things we've been picking up a lot of gaming and uh, esports uh, type of clients. Um, and it's been a, been a pretty hot industry this year. So I'm uh, enjoying being back here. Thanks, Brian. So let's start this um, conference off. Uh, I'm going to call on Corey first. Um, so Corey, with COVID-19, how did it affect um, the audits for 2020 this year? Uh, talk about maybe remote testing, testing inventory, doing things virtual. And um, I'd like to talk about after that, after you get into it, what's going on with the opening of the offices around the country as it relates to accounting. So Corey, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Neil. Uh, I think for all of us on this panel, and really for a lot of those that are listening, it's been a uh, the second year of a very unusual and difficult audit process. Last year, when we sat here at this conference, we were really uh, one month into the pandemic and a lot of companies had not yet filed. The SEC had given most companies, uh, had given all companies the opportunity to delay their filings uh, until June. Uh, there was no such delay this year. Um, and you know, over the year, I think companies adapted to this, the firms adapted to this. Um, it's very difficult. I think last year when we were here, most of the field testing had been done, and I'm assuming we're talking about December 31 year end. Uh, most of the field testing had been done. Um, it was just a matter of getting to the finish line. But this year we had to adapt and do the audit um, virtually from the office. Um, very little for most companies, I think, very little auditor involvement at, at the field, uh, at the client premises. Um, and, you know, auditing has sort of been moving that way to begin with, with the advent of the better technology, the better accounting systems. But really now, uh, this year, uh, I don't know how many companies actually had auditors in the field, uh, created a lot of difficulties, um, especially because uh, December, when a lot of the testing would start, that's when this last wave hit. And for us in LA and California, things were virtually locked down. I'm sure it was the same in a lot of the other country, uh, country <clears throat> states and counties. Uh, so things like inventory observations that we would normally do had to get canceled. You know, we couldn't get into the facilities. Um, 404 control testing, which you know, there's a lot of observations uh, that are involved in that. You know, uh, they had to be different ways of doing it. A lot of it was being done virtually. Um, not the ideal. Thing to do, and hopefully the firms have uh, had enough ability to to get to where they needed to be to satisfy the auditing uh, standards. Um, you know, uh, we'll see. Uh, but I think the firms did do a good job. Um, I think most of us, the staff was working remotely, um, haven't really had open offices themselves. So a lot of the interaction uh, between the audit team, uh, you know, had to be done virtually. So we'll have to, uh, I think for the most part, everybody adapted. And I think the audits got done and I don't think that there's going to be any deficiencies in the audit procedures from the people that I've talked to and just seeing the type of work that most firms have been doing. 
but it was difficult. And uh, hopefully next year, you know, we will be uh, back in the field. But I think going forward, the amount of auditor involvement in the field is going to be substantially reduced, which I think is probably good for the companies and for the auditors. Hmm. So let me throw this, uh, let me make a comment. And then I'm going to ask John. So John Friedman, we try to follow what the big firms do. So out of our 13 offices, I would say 12 of them have been a skeleton crew. Um, yet the office that Brian and I sit at, for whatever reason, we have a lot of young kids, 24 to 28, and we've been open since last June. Like 77 out of 80 kids, they come to the office. I think they like the collaboration. We've had, we got like 12 new people. So, you know, building up those bonds. I just wanted to see how you've done in California and has your office been open? How are the numbers? I mean, what can you add? So what I can add, Neil, is um, towards the end of last summer, we were attempting to get on a path of getting folks, getting folks back to the office. I think, I think the industry itself uh, has probably shown that working remotely, um, of course, dealing with the audit issues that have to be involved with going to the client site, but putting that aside for a second, you know, working remotely, you know, can be effective uh, and, and things can get done. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the overarching theme is, um, you know, I don't know if working remotely would 100% replace uh, you know, being in the office and being able to collaborate with your team members. There's still a, a good amount of hands-on training uh, interaction uh, that's probably, you know, beneficial uh, from being in the office. Um, we were back on track to, to, you know, kind of reopen and, and get folks back in. And I think everybody was, uh, was looking forward to that. But as was just talked about with Corey, then the second wave hit and that kind of put a pause on things. Um, right now, we're, we're hoping to uh, reopen starting in the summer. I think we're targeting sometime in June, early June. And right now, offices are open um, on, a, on a voluntary basis here at the firm. Um, I, think, I think the people going to the office has been somewhat scattered. I'm not sure if there's a pattern at the moment in time. I do think a theme that, that I am seeing is that people are hoping to get vaccinated um, before they make a decision whether or not to return. Um, but I'm, I'm hopeful that over the summer, as, uh, as more and more, you know, vaccines get distributed around the country, that people will still, you know, start to go back to the office. Because for as much as, for as, much as this can get done remotely, I think it's beneficial for all of us uh, to be in front of each other for, for at least a period of time. I, I know my, one of my biggest pushes for this busy season was I, I, I made sure to have constant, constant video calls uh, with my team members, only because... You know, I, I enjoy that 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 interaction, that that face to face, and being able to to work with people and train young people. So, um, while that worked, it's still not the same uh, as in person. So, hopefully, hopefully, we get back to uh, get back to seeing each other in person over the summer. Got it. Thank you, John. And what, uh, Brian, um, what have you noticed? I know you handle some companies overseas, and how how, how did we do that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know. Overseas, there was a, a lot of lockdown as well. Um, you know, we were able to do a lot of Zoom calls uh, with our Chinese affiliates and then, you know, with uh, clients from their own houses, uh, you know, doing Zoom calls that way. Uh, it helped that I think, you know, we had a lot of our people in the office. Um, you know, we were doing our, our best to keep socially distant and still, you know, staying, uh, you know, making every other cube, uh, you know, open and putting a lot of people in offices so that unless you had to uh, really go and meet with somebody, you were kind of socially distanced. But I think that kept the camaraderie, kept the, uh, kept the flow going and allowed us to move through these audits a little faster than, uh, than we usually would on a remote basis. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. So John, uh, welcome again to the conference. Um, with the SPAC market being so hot still, what are some of the key accounting items a SPAC needs to deal with throughout its life cycle? And last week we had some kind of release from the SEC reclassifying um, warrants. Can you talk a little about the SPAC market? Sure. Um, you know, I'll, I'll do so knowing that I'm sure SPACs are uh, going to be a, a 
hot word at, at the conference. And uh, I'm, I'm, I think there's another panel or two that are probably talking about SPACs dedicated. But um, I think the first thing I'll, I'll say, Neil, is a SPAC is, is an SEC registrant, uh, it, just like any other, any other reporting company. It, it may be a shell. Uh, and have very very minimal operations, but that doesn't necessarily that doesn't avail itself or relieve itself of any of the requirements um, uh, that you would see for you know, you know a, a smaller a smaller reporting or an EGC company. Um, financial statements have to be prepared in accordance with with US GAAP and the SEC standards, like any other company. Uh, during its search phase, it's required to obtain uh, PCOB audits. Uh, when that when the IPO closes, one of the nuances of a SPAC is it even needs a second audit. Uh, a balance sheet only audit proving uh, that the funds that were received in the IPO are in fact there and are in the trust. Um, during the search phase, it's required to file form 10Ks and 10Qs. And, and again, even though uh, it's, it's shell companies with limited activity, there's still nuances uh, to the reporting of a spec that have to be dealt with, whether it's uh, reporting of EPS or uh, uh, the accounting for uh, the, the shares, uh, the redeemable shares, which of course aren't included in equity. They're considered temporary equity. And if you've ever seen the footnotes of a SPAC financial statements, you would think it's anything but a shell company. The footnotes are quite lengthy uh, and very, very, very detailed. Uh, and that, of course, requires uh, a sound uh, management and accounting team to be ordered to make sure that the, you know, you're reporting uh, in the manner that's required. And of course, in the time frame that's required for, for a public company. Um, in regards to this, to this warrant matter, that, that is true. Neil, about uh, about ten days ago or so, uh, the SEC started contacting uh, the major accounting firms in the country uh, on this, and then of course last, I think it was last Monday, uh, they they put out release basically saying uh, warrants that have been outstanding for uh, or used in SPACs for quite some time now, probably years, um, were basically being re-reviewed, uh, and provisions of the warrants uh, seem to trigger liability accounting and not equity accounting, which was the position of the past. Uh, and of course, they also came out and said that, you know, warrants should be re-reviewed or reviewed for other provisions as well, uh, not just the, the one or two uh, provisions that they highlighted in their, uh, in their release. Um, I will tell you, it's somewhat an evolving thing at the moment. Uh, as of now, we know uh, that there's a couple provisions that were specifically highlighted that if they exist, would likely need to, uh, uh, the warrants have to be recorded as liabilities. Uh, I know there's currently a very active, very, very active and, and ongoing effort in the industry amongst, amongst SEC counsel and the big four, et cetera, trying to determine if there are any other uh, clauses in the warrants for the SPACs that could trigger liability accounting. And of course, how to, you know, how SPACs should deal with it or how the warrant should be corrected to fix the matter. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll get a little bit more a little bit more clarity this week on on what the next steps are with that initiative. So we are we on hold right now? I mean, I know that we have a few SPACs we're working on, and I know you guys are, you know, a leader in the industry. I mean, are we on hold right now for a couple of weeks, or are we? You know, what what do you think? Well. The timing is the timing is really tough to tell. I, I really hope it's not a couple of weeks, but it's it's so tough to tell. Sometimes these things take time. Uh, I don't know if being on hold is the way to think about it. Um, I, I think the SEC came out and they gave clear in, uh, guidance on something should be a liability. So I would think if if you have a spec that's going to treat their warrants as liabilities, I I would think they're not necessarily on hold. Uh, at the moment, though, uh, you would think as, as this issue continues to evolve and some more uh, guidance comes out again, hopefully this week, that warrants being included with inequity uh, would be able to be resolved. And so if anything's on hold right now or quote unquote on hold, I would think it's folks trying to say that maybe their warrant should be equity or something like that. I think I think we need a few more days and hopefully not multiple weeks, but a few more days to see how this pans out. Got it. Thank, thanks so much, John. All right, moving on to Brian. Um, Brian, with the rush to file, to file IPOs recently, you know, everybody they call us, they go, Levine, when can you get done? Hurry up and get it done. How long is it going to take? Can you touch base on the differences between emerging growth companies versus your smaller reporting companies uh, versus like a confidential treatment? I know we picked up 
an IPO. We had to redo restatements and, you know, they were like, well, we're, we're using a very large law firm and we're not expecting to be reviewed by the SEC and this is going to be done in 20 days or whatever. So Brian, what, what, what are you seeing out there? Uh, I mean, well, first off, you know, the difference between emerging growth company and small, uh, small reporting companies, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but the emerging growth companies are the ones that uh, you start off with your initial IPO and you get five years, uh, you know, to file as this. Uh, and that, you know, as long as you don't go over it's like a billion point seven uh, in revenue or have a billion dollars in, you know, non-convertible debt for like a three year period. Uh, you can still qualify as emerging growth. And what that allows you to do is, you know, have less narrative uh, disclosures in your financial statements. Um, you don't need to do 404B. Uh, you only need to have two years of P&Ls audited uh, in your financial statements. Um, and one of the things that I like the most as an auditor is you don't have to actually have uh, CAMS reported or critical uh, auditing matters in your financial statements opinion either. Uh, so I like that piece of it. Um, as far as the, you know, smaller reporting companies, a lot of them can be the same. Uh, you can qualify for both. Um, but these are companies that have, you know, less than $250 million of public float, uh, or they've got less than $100 million in revenue, um, and, you know, less than uh, $7 million of public float, uh, things like that. Now, once you, once you get over $100 million in revenue, uh, audited revenue, I should say, that's when you start to trigger, uh, you know, whether you need to be accelerated filer or not an accelerated filer, um, but you can still remain a uh, emerging growth company and get the smaller reporting uh, requirements as well for the limited disclosures and also the two years of uh, P&Ls. Uh, so that's something you want to try and keep uh, as long as you can, I guess, from the requirements of reporting. Um, and then the confidentiality uh, treatment you mentioned, you know, a lot of companies as they're filing their S-1s, um, especially in the emerging growth companies, uh, they can talk to the SEC ahead of time, file these things uh, with the SEC confidentially. They don't get disclosed to the public yet. And this way you can work through certain accounting issues with the SEC uh, prior to having to get, you know, S public SEC comment letters and things like that. So does that, does that take longer, Brian? I mean, if you're working with the SEC and it's confidential, do they call you up and instead of doing, is it like an S1A instead of going that route, you just work it out and how long does it take? Well, it depends on the comments that they give you, but uh, it, it can be quicker because there's not something out there that you have to go and, and restate. You don't have to go through, um, you know, uh, typical amendments that you would have to do because it's all private. Nothing's out there publicly. Um, you know, your audit firm doesn't have to go and put a restatement out there if they have to change a number. Um, so it's definitely a, a much easier path to go through uh, the confidentiality. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that, Corey? No, I think uh, Brian covered, you know, most of the uh, the topics. Uh, it's interesting you commented on the <clears throat> CAMS because I think that was a very difficult part of the audits for this year. And if you're able to get away from having to go through the CAM analysis, that was uh, a definite uh, plus. Yeah, John. No, no, nothing to add. I, we're gonna, I think, uh, I think we're gonna jump into CAMS in a minute here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, Corey, um, you spoke about the pandemic. Now, regarding the financial statements um, during uh, the COVID nineteen, uh, what were the some of the big issues, uh, like a going concern, impairment of goodwill, the effect on leases, and I mean, I went to a seminar with this you know, the lease modifications. And it took about five hours of listening. And it all, it, to me, it seemed to come back to the same point. But um, what did you notice with the financial statements during the pandemic? Well, the financial statement issues were kind of what you would expect. And I think they also kind of changed over the last year. I think when we sat here a year ago, 
you know, nobody really knew what was going on. It was gloom and doom. Uh, everybody was afraid to go outside. Uh, there was a lot of issues related to going concern, you know, are we can be able to continue, uh, what's our sales projections are going to be. Um, <clears throat> I think companies had to face the liquidity issues um, that they probably never faced before. These things kind of normalized a little bit over the year. Uh, we saw a lot of companies actually had pretty decent fiscal years, uh, year ending 2020, but a lot of industries were devastated. And in those industries that were devastated, there were a lot of issues and, uh, you know, going concern issues became uh, very significant in a lot of those types of companies. Um, leases are huge issues. Retail companies, they didn't know if they're going to close stores, restaurants, uh, you know, the, the, with the advent of the new lease rules, you had to put these leases on the balance sheet. So now if you're going to close a store, you don't know if you're gonna close the store, huge issues and what you do with that right of use asset. Um, as you said, Neil, uh, very complicated. And I think a lot of companies you know, had those issues. Um, there are issues, even though you may not have had a going concern, if you had goodwill and other types of intangibles on your books, um, even though your liquidity would be okay, you have to have projections going forward and if your sales were down this year, uh, that kind of gets part of your impairment analysis for goodwill. So I think a lot of companies had a struggle with goodwill, long-term asset realization issues, even if they didn't have going concern issues. Um, so that became a big challenge. And a lot of companies were forced to do valuations. A lot of companies were forced to look at these, um, the goodwill. Uh, There's a lot of goodwill write downs this year, probably more so than ever. Um, Again, it was because a lot of what companies do is based upon projections. And this year you have a down year, you don't know what you're, you, you may be okay, but your customers, your, your vendors are all kind of related. Uh, inventories were an issue. Um, you know, are you gonna be able to liquidate your, your inventory? Do you have uh, reserves or do you have a long-term impairment issue there? Uh, that became a real significant audit issue in a lot of our clients. Um, and then there was the disclosure issues, which really comes from the SEC, and they really wanted a frank and honest discussion about the effects of COVID, and they wanted it in your MDNA, and they, um, you know, and I'm not sure companies initially took it that seriously, but I think a lot of us saw that the SEC came out with a couple enforcement actions against some of these companies because they were not truthful in their assessment of um, what the effects of the pandemic had. I think Cheesecake Factory was the one company that made a lot of uh, press because of their lack of ability to uh, openness and projecting what could happen to some of their leases. So it was a very interesting year. Hopefully this year, you know, things will get back to normal, but I think, you know, there's still going to be these lingering issues. Yeah. Hey, Corey, did, did you have, or John, any of your public companies take this uh, PPP payroll uh, protection program loans and you know, in the beginning, I know like uh, the Lakers took it and they gave it back and some of these public companies were scared, but I think some of your smaller public companies did take some of this and how did you treat it if you have had it? Well, we, I've seen a lot of uh, companies take it, you know, it's a, uh, it's a debt on the books uh, until it gets forgiven. Uh, but I think a lot of, especially those companies or industries that got hit, they took it. Um, and, uh, you know, here in Los Angeles, in that area, you know, there's a lot of companies last year completely closed down, uh, warehouses completely closed down. So I think a lot of companies in those situations took the PPP loans. Uh, we'll see. I haven't seen too many of them. I think the forgiveness process is just starting for a lot of them. Um, some of them have gotten it forgiven. When it gets forgiven, then you get to take the gain on extinguishment. Uh, so we'll have to see how it uh, plays out. So the gain on extinguishment, I, I think the PPP is totally non-taxable, right? So uh, what the heck? Is Certain it? states, I think it's uh, California, it's not. It is taxable, I believe. But uh, federally, it's not taxable. Right. Wow. For now. For now. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I know there's a PPP number two that just got extended by the current administration through May. 
31. It's a little different, but um, for those companies out there that are listening that are private, um, I believe if a quarter went down over another quarter from 19 to 20, um, you may be eligible to apply for that as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, let's move on. So uh, John, um, Brian had mentioned, I believe, or Corey, the, the word critical accounting matters, CAM. Um, when I usually hear of CAM, I think about you know, rents that are paid or something else from common property, but I think this is a little different. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, critical CAM stands for critical audit matter. Um, th this was a new uh, PCOB standard that went into effect for the largest, uh, for the auditors of the largest companies in the country at, for fiscal year end 12, 31, 19, and then basically for everybody else. Uh, for fiscal year end 1231 2020. Uh, certain, certain companies were exempted from you know, needing the CAMs in, in the auditor's report, uh, mainly emerging growth companies. Uh, so if you do, it, it was mentioned before, if you, if you are an EGC, uh, your auditor um, didn't have to include CAMs in their audit report. And again, it's, it's, an, auditor, it's an auditor requirement. Uh, so, so the auditors are, are responsible for uh, evaluating um, a bunch of different, a bunch of different matters, and determining whether or not uh, an, an extended paragraph on a critical audit matter could be more than one needs to be included in the audit report. Um, you know, I, I will tell you, it it definitely. Uh, I think it was Corey that said it, but it, it definitely added to the to the challenges uh, of the year, or at least uh, you know the additional uh time they need to be spent uh you know for audits this year it was the first time a lot of us had to do this uh you know for our clients um you know it, it really adds a, a decent amount of time and hours to, to a given engagement some of which may the client may not even necessarily feel uh because it's our it's our requirement to have to include the cam but it, it definitely requires a, a lot of time and hours to, to to get it where it needs to be uh, i'll tell you i i began discussing potential cams with my clients during the second and third quarters of 2020 uh, and was, you know, reviewing drafts of what the CAM report may look like, you know, probably 45 to 60, maybe even 75 days out before even finishing the audit. And, and only because it's, it's, you know, it's such a high level thing, meaning you have to not only go through this very detailed analysis to determine if something qualifies to be reported as a CAM, but it's, it's something that's included in our audit reports. You know, it's, it's literally on the, you know, in the audit report with the standard language that everybody has seen for some time. So it needs to be put together properly, read well. Uh, it's going to be there for the world to see. So it definitely takes a lot of time internally to, to get it right. Um, and with everything, while there are set rules on how to evaluate it, there's also, you know, judgment involved uh, on, on an auditor, you know, on the auditor side in determining what needs to be reported as a CAM. Uh, it could be anything from a, a very significant estimate to a, a, an unusual transaction uh, that occurred during the year. Um, so I think the overall effect is, you know, maybe the clients necessarily don't feel the effect to the degree that we did, but it's definitely something that, especially for the first year with us having to deal with it, took some time, uh, needs significant amount of planning to make sure you get it right, because it's just not the type of thing where leading up to the, you know, a week before the issuance of the audit report, you can kind of rush and, and put together. It really does take a good amount of time on behalf of um, the audit firms and everybody on this panel uh, in order to get it done, get it done properly. Uh, thanks, John. Appreciate that. Um, all right, let's move right along. So Corey, um, a lot of rush to equity going on right now. I'm sure you and John, just like Brian and I, you know, I, we, I've never seen this activity and I've been doing this since 1999. So what is this meaning, the rush to get deals done? How is it affecting the accounting staff, your auditors, your time utilization, um, staffing? You know, let's talk about from an accounting standpoint, like where are we getting all these bodies to do all this work? And um Comfort letters, pro formas. I mean, it just seems like the accounts are buried right now. Yeah, I would agree that uh, in my 
<clears throat> experience, this has probably been the most intense period of time with underwriting and offerings going on, maybe back to the late 90s when we had the whole internet uh, rush and the boom, uh, creates an incredible amount of work outside of the audit. And a lot of that work really falls to the company and the companies that have the more mature accounting staffs and seasoned CFOs, um, you know, it, it's probably not much of that of, of an issue as it is for the emerging companies. And those companies that are coming on to the reporting system for the first time, you know, they get wooed by the investment bankers, you know, they give them a timeline um, with the hopes of filing and then ultimately the raising of this equity. But the amount of work that goes in, I, you know, from my experience, I just see that these companies completely underestimated. They don't understand the workload that they're faced with and preparing all the diligence that's going to be needed, putting the documents uh, there for not only one law firm to review, but usually two, the underwriters law firm. Um, and then, you know, the meetings, and then as you say, the cap tables, the uh, comfort letters, which really relate to the auditors, but we still have to work with management. There's just an incredible amount of work that has to get done in a very, very short period of time. Um, and, you know, companies that are going to go do this, you know, really have to be prepared. Um, and it's not going to have to fall on the auditors. It's going to be on the company's internal accounting to, to get this done. And they need to really understand and appreciate what it takes. Yeah. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, we... I've never seen the uh, activity like this. And, and this brings me um, to Brian. Uh, Brian, there are some companies that we know are on this call today um, at the Planet Microcap Showcase that want to go public. They're private companies. Um, maybe you could discuss how a company can go public here in the U.S. Uh, by way of reverse merger, IPO, APO, S1. SPAC, uh, maybe give a little color on that. Sure. Uh, I mean, we're seeing uh, a lot of reverse mergers, um, you know, taking place uh, nowadays that I guess it's a cheaper, you know, uh, much more efficient uh, and faster way to get public for some of these private companies. Um, you know, they don't have to give up as much equity sometimes uh, in doing that. Uh, the drawback is you don't get the, the big uh, capital raise associated with an IPO. Um, the IPO is, is something that, you know, can typically take, you know, six to 12 months to go through, whereas, you know, a reverse merger uh, typically takes, you know, a shorter period of time. It's a matter of time to get through the audit period um, of the private company. And with a reverse merger, you're, you're basically finding a shell company, a company that's got no activities, uh, but that's already public, that's currently reporting. Um, and this way, when you reverse merge into them, it's already a public company. You don't have to go through that approval process to get public. Um, one of the drawbacks, though, there too, is that sometimes these shell companies have some history. Uh, so you really have to do some due diligence to make sure there's no liabilities or uh, bad actors associated with the shells that can follow along and you know, now be attached to your name. Um, and you mentioned uh, SPACs as well. SPACs, uh, I know John has mentioned uh, and given a, a good history on, on those now. They're very popular now. One of the nice things with the SPACs is that you know the money is already raised ahead of time uh, when the private company is identified. Um, but the hard part about that is that if you're a private company, you have to be identified by the SPAC. You can't go call up the SPAC and say, "Hey, we'd like to go through a SPAC and become public." Uh, it's a lot uh, a lot harder that way. Um, but it's you know in today's market, I think just since 2018, I think we've about tripled the number of SPACs out there as far as uh, the dollar value associated with them. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fast growing market. And so Brian, with, with the reverse mergers that had a, not the greatest reputation or connotation, I just know we saw one where we found a $2 million bank liability from seven years ago or eight years yeah. ago. And the company had no idea. And we said, hey, listen, you know, it's got to be recorded. So that had to get recorded. But are the reverse mergers being done simultaneously with a raise? Because I remember in the old days that a company would reverse in, then they had no money, and then they couldn't do anything anyway. So have you seen? What have you seen? Uh, some are. Um, 
you know, they they don't have to be though. Um, it depends on the type of and nature of the client that's that's looking to go public. Uh, you know, some of these private companies have enough liquidity on their own, so they're not looking to do the raise associated with it. Some don't have it, and they see this as a quick way to get public and and then do the raise along with it. Um, one of the things too, though, is that the SEC does tend to look at these reverse mergers a little more, um, you know, with a little more scrutiny than they might an IPO. Uh, especially because the IPO process a lot of time goes through that confidentiality filings ahead of time. So matters get cleared ahead of time uh, with the SEC. Um, whereas with the reverse mergers, you know, the, the first time the SEC has seen them, they're already out there. Yes. So basically the reverses are, are, are on the OTC, right? Where some people are, uh, I guess, uh, listening now. Um, yeah. So, I don't know if, you know, maybe Corey can just chime in. And what about if you have OTC stock, Corey? I mean, I've heard, you know, if a company, they can't deposit their stock, so to speak, in, in a brokerage account unless they have millions of dollars. So they sit on the stock and, unless there's an uplist. Have you seen anybody or heard anybody talking about this? Well, liquidity of your stock, I think, really relates to the exchange that you're on. The OTC is, you know, and I'm not an expert in this area, but basically, uh, you know, the, the, the NASDAQ, uh, the New York Stock Exchange, much more liquid exchanges. You know, I don't think that you could go to a broker and, and expect to get your account margin if uh, the shares are traded on OTC. <clears throat> but yeah, it's not, definitely uh, OTC, you know, is not as good as an exchange as for that particular, you know, for that matter. Got it. So uh, John, Brian mentioned very briefly, and you spoke about the SPAC before, um, but um, what should a target company expect as it prepares for the deep SPAC trans transaction and the need for PCAOB audits? Well, uh, obviously, the target company <clears throat> is is about to go from being, you know, privately held to to publicly traded. So it's it's a completely different different ball game for them. Um, you know, to me, uh, you know, two of the biggest uh, a lot of these a lot of these targets are um, they've already been audited. Uh, but you know, being audited as a privately held company, of course, is much different than operating as a as a publicly traded company. Pro probably the two biggest things that 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 these privately held companies have to ask are, you know, first, do you have the appropriate amount of resources in your accounting and financial reporting department? Um, you know, many public companies separate the kind of the call it the controller role, you know, the financial reporting and controller role to the SEC and the SEC reporting function. Um, so this could be very new, uh, you know, for, for a target company and something that they have to deal with in a relatively quick you know, quick time frame. Uh, I mean, a despacking transaction, typically it's a reverse merger, except instead of the shell being possibly on the OTC or have no cash, this shell company is on a national exchange and may have hundreds of millions in cash. Uh, but most of them end up being reverse mergers, just like any other reverse merger. So you go from being privately held to public pretty quickly. And then of course, the second thing is uh, your overall internal controls. You know, they're about to be subject to the requirements of being a public company under Sarbanes-Oxley. So uh, is a company prepared, uh, you know, from, from, from that standpoint as well? Um, you know, one issue that, that does pop up on the DSPAC transaction is, um, you know, the financials of the target company have to be audited in accordance with the PCOB standards. Uh, and for, you know, whatever reason, it could vary, but it happens every now and then. Uh, where the, the auditors of the target company are not in a position to reissue that audit opinion under PCOB standards. It could be because um, they may not want to, uh, or it could be because, which you know you would probably see more often is the, the auditors weren't expecting the company to go public and there's an independence issue uh, because the auditors have to be independent under PCOB standards. So every now and then um, re-audits have to get done uh, in accordance with the PCOB standards, which of course can delay uh, you know, delay the transaction. Got it. Uh, thank you. Um, moving on to um, comment letters. Uh, Brian, what are some of the typical SEC common areas um, that we've seen in the last five or six months 
uh, given a company's trying to get public? So it's interesting. We've uh, we're actually experiencing a lot less comment letters than we uh, we used to. Uh, I know back in 2016, we're about three times as many comment letters uh, in the industry uh, as we are right now, which is a it's a good trend. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's because we're doing a great job here as auditors or if that's uh, just less staff at the SEC. But uh, you know, one of the things that uh, we expected to see a little bit more of was you know COVID related comments, and we haven't seen as many of those uh, as we expected. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you know the hot topic has been is you know SPACs. I think are going to be uh, looked at now with with the comment letters, um, but. Traditionally, we've seen a lot of non-GAAP uh, disclosures being coming in the, in the front part of the documents that have been getting comments. Um, you're allowed to have some non-GAAP disclosures in there, but you really have to make sure and be careful that you're not promoting them uh, above what the GAAP disclosures are or trying to make them uh, more prominent. A lot of companies like to try and show you know, what they would have been if they didn't have to do these you know, derivative calculations or things like that. And you have to make sure um, that you're um, not making those those calculations as prominent as you are the gap ones. Um, a lot of making sure that you know the risk factors for the industry are disclosed. Uh, making sure that you know you're using clear and you know non uh, lawyer terms as you're discussing your company, and making sure that you're not making you know claims that you really don't have support for about how great your industry is, how big of a market share you expect to have, things like that. Uh, it's been the the big turn that we've seen so far. Anybody else? Okay. So um, I've just been told that we have about 10 minutes left and we're going to go for another hour. That's what I'm going to tell everybody. So with <laughs> my 10 minutes late left, I'd like to get into maybe some Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency, blockchain, I happened to be on a call the other day with three of my other SEC partners and three out of the four guys really couldn't say much, but my head of the uh, cryptocurrency practice was amazing. So John, I know that Markham has a substantial uh, cryptocurrency digital asset uh, practice. Uh, what are the latest authoritative guidance uh, been put forth for uh, these type of accounting transactions? Um, are we seeing audits of companies like Grayscale uh, going to be on national exchanges? Uh, what are you seeing out there? So that's, that's true. So Markham does have a, a digital asset and blockchain services group. I, I'm a member of it, um, and it consists of members of our audit practice, tax, uh, IT, uh, and advisory groups. Uh, and of course, it's it's been an essential group, you know, of our firm to be able to continue to provide, you know, services to companies operating, uh, you know, in this in this space. Um, you know, in in regards to the literature, you know, there still continues to really be no authoritative gap at the moment, uh, you know, for for accounting uh, for digital currencies or digital assets such as such as Bitcoin. Uh, hopefully, as as many of these larger companies in the country continue to add these assets to their balance sheets, maybe that'll change. But for now, uh, the feeling continues to be uh, from the regulators that the existing framework for the accounting and even the auditing uh, can be applied to, to companies uh, you know, in this space. Uh, I will tell you that for, for the most part, there's a general consensus between the accounting firms and even the regulators as to how digital currencies should be accounted for. Uh, so for example, for Bitcoin, uh, typically, you see Bitcoin accounted for as an intangible asset on a company's balance sheet in accordance with ASC 350, um, which, you know, of course, requires, you know, impairment charges if necessary, uh, but with no corresponding write up if, if the value were to recover. Uh, so on one hand, while there's been a consensus, I don't I'm not sure the consensus is that it all still makes sense. Uh, but but for now, there's still no authoritative gap. Uh, to account for this. And, and I'm hopeful that, you know, over time, as more widespread adoption continues to happen, that that may change. Right. And I, I remember the beginning, we had a lot of companies coming to us and they said, hey, we're doing blockchain. And to be honest, they had nothing going on. I'm sure the SEC has 
clamp down on many of those companies that just wanted the name to get their stock moving and price moving. I mean, have you seen any of that? On the yeah. Market? Yeah. I mean, I think obviously there's, there's, been, there were instances of that in the past. Uh, there were issues with initial coin offerings in the past. Um, I think, I, I think the industry is seeing a push towards, uh, you know, institutionalization and maturity. I, I personally don't know if I've seen much of that lately. Uh, and, and the more and more of the larger companies come out that are, you know, incorporating this stuff into their books and records, hopefully the less and less you'll see of the, something like a changing the name or, or an ICO that uh, should have registered their, their tokens but didn't or something like that. Ho I'm hopeful that, that those instances are, are, are in the past as, as the, uh, you know, the asset class in the industry begins to continues to mature. All right. Thank you, John. That was great. Uh, so, Corey, um, we always like to talk about corporate governance, audit committees, um, independent boards. Maybe you just want to tell the folks out there uh, what to expect. Well, all those are very important, especially if you were to talk to an auditor at the SEC. Uh, but the reality of it is, depending upon a, a lot of that's dictated by the market, uh, which you know, exchange you're trading on. Um, but uh, if you're going to have uh, your controls audited, um, if you're going to make uh, <clears throat> disclosures in your 404 about the effectiveness of your accounting controls, you know, you need to have a good, uh, you need to have corporate governance and you need to have probably independent boards and public companies because control really starts at the top. And without those two, if you don't have those, it's really difficult to say you have an, an effective uh, system of internal control. So it's very important, especially if you were to ask the auditors, uh, some of the smaller OTC trading firms, you know, they don't seem to have those, especially the independent uh, boards. Um, but certainly as you go get up, grow, and as certainly as you try to go to some of these bigger exchange, you have to have them and you need them for uh, uh, control procedures to uh, claim that you have efficient, effective controls. Thanks, Corey. Um, so we are running out of time, but before we go, I know that Weinberg, Markham, and Friedman have substantial China practices, right? I know Drew and Corey's out there all the time. Brian might be a concurrent partner on 20 Chinese in engagement. So since the recovery, I'll call the 2011 uh, when I stopped going to China, I've been there 16 times or so. They don't need me anymore to go out there. It's so, what has given rise to this crazy activity where these huge companies are just flocking here and they seem to be real? And of course, you get one or two like this Luke and Coffee the other day. But what's giving rise, I mean, to this major? hot activity again. Well, I, I think it's just the availability of capital here in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, they keep coming, these Chinese companies keep coming here. Um, you know, it's very difficult though uh, for these uh, companies, I think, to remain you know, credible in the United States. There's just so much going on in China right now um there's uh pro you know there's the differences uh with the uh, sec and the pcaob not a, not allowing the u.s auditors in to review these audit these work papers you can't get the chinese work papers out of china uh so i'm not you know right now the chinese uh you know continue to look to the u.s uh, markets um and i know for us we have of course the engagement partners usually chinese the concurring partner will fill in whoever uh, we feel is has that experience and then we also put a working partner on it with QC so we've got a lot of resources uh, dedicated to it uh, it's just it seems I'm getting a new lead Corey and John and Brian like every night I'm getting calls at night hey Levine and we we we're just we're our staff is, uh, wow. So um, yeah, anyway, um, I think what we're gonna do is wrap it up. Um, again, I'll turn it to our panelists. 
you know, you can maybe you want to give out your website, how we can get a hold of you. And I want to thank everybody. You know, I've got a lot more questions, but you know, they're they're telling me that's it, Levine. So John, why don't I throw it back to you and give us a quick wrap up? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate Neil uh, asking me to, to join and, and speak on the panel today. Um, all my contact information, email and, and uh, you know, phone information is on the Markham website and on my LinkedIn profile. Um, it, it was a pleasure to be here and uh, hopefully the audience, uh, you know, you know, got some value out of it. Thanks, John. Corey? No, thank you, Neil. It was great to be on the panel again. Um, once again, I'm with uh, Weinberg and Company, located here in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, if I don't uh, hear from anyone, I look forward to next year's panel. Great. Brian? Uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to seeing how this goes. I uh, want to hear from uh, as many people as we can. Uh, any additional questions, uh, you know, feel free to reach out with uh, you know, our email address is bkerns at freedmanlp.com, uh, or you can check me out on LinkedIn. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Bobby Kraft, are you out there? Yes, sir. All right. Well, uh, Neil, where can people go and find more information on you? Well, they can find me uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I'm the co-chair of the practice here, so it's just and Levine at FriedmanLLP.com. I guess I've been here now, ooh, 1998. So I'm one of the old veterans at age 59. What could I tell you? You know, Neil, I was alive then, you know, yeah, barely, you but, but, I, but yeah. yeah. I, re I, re I remember, I remember when you were born. <laughs> I know you, <laughs> all right. Yeah, I know. It was, uh, it's like yesterday. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for joining us today for this panel. This was great. And uh, we look forward to the next one. All right, guys. Take yeah, care. Sure. Have, a, have a great summer.